Hi there. Um, I want to speak a little bit about the Narniad, i.e. the literary universe created by C.S. Lewis. Now, he, I think it's fair to say he's a household name or he's, he's a well-established author, known um, primarily for the Narnia series, but also as a Christian apologist. And there are a lot of interesting things about this man and about his literary canon. Um, firstly, I grew up with C.S. Lewis, but particularly the Chronicles of Narnia. And I imagine many people of my generation, people now in the early 30s, late 20s, early 30s, did. And I think there's one particular reason for that. Um, C.S. Lewis died in 1963, so he's not a contemporary author. He died over 50 years ago. So why is it that my generation in particular have, um, in a sense, grown up with him? Uh, the Disney films, of course, were mid-2000s onwards. And I think the answer is uh, there was a series made by the BBC in the late 1980s, up to 1990. And this is the series. Now, I was very lucky to get my hands on this. This is not easy to find. You can get it on YouTube, but it's not easy to buy. So. When I saw this, I had to get it. C.S. Lewis, The Chronicles of Narnia, the BBC adaptation. And basically, it was a series of four television films, serials in a sense, made from um, 1988 to 1990. And it covered um, four of the books in the Chronicles of Narnia series. The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and the silver chair interestingly enough they are the four books that have most been adapted in fact as far as i know the other three books in the series the magician's nephew the horse and his boy and the last battle have never been adapted to screen in any form i don't know about stage productions here we go this is the four books now you might say what is a man in his early 30s doing with children's books? Well, this is part of the appeal of the Narniad. Um, of course, they were written for children. And of course, we grew up with them as children. I remember in Belfast at that time, well, it would have been the early 90s. Um, there was also stage production. Um, I forget the particular venue in Belfast. It might be in the Europa Theatre, which is a big grand theatre. And I remember being absolutely mesmerised by that stage performance. It came out shortly after this television film. I recently met my cousin, who I haven't seen since we were children, basically. She remembered it as well. She happened to be at the same performance. So that really says something, that you can remember something 20, 25 years later. Um, now, I just want to speak a little bit about the... The BBC series and also an important part of Lewis, which is the long standing theory that there is a Christian analogy with his writing. Um, Lewis's theology is an important aspect of it, it definitely played an influence on his life, a profound influence. In fact, I have this book, which is definitely not for children. This is very in depth, very theological. Planet Narnia, The Seven Heavens, and the Imagination of C.S. Lewis, Michael Ward. It's very academic, it's very in-depth, and I haven't read it yet. Um, but basically, Michael Ward is a, is a clergyman of the Church of England, so I think that would be a very interesting insight. He's getting very much into the astrology and the planetary symbolism of the Narnia series. And there is definitely planetary symbolism there. Um, before I continue and before I discuss a little bit the BBC series, versus the Disney series. I happen to like both, actually. You know, people tend to have this idea you have to choose one or the other, and that applies to other things as well. But I actually think both are good in their own way, and I'll come to that. But firstly, about C.S. Lewis. Well, um, he was born in my city, in Belfast, in 1898. At that time, it was still United Ireland. Um, and as a young man, C.S. Lewis was fascinated by Irish mythology. That played a big role on his life. Um, he, like many young men of his generation, served on the Western Front of the First World War, I believe specifically at the Battle of Arras, um, as did his older brother, um, known to him as Warney. They were very close. 
Um, in fact, his brother was a military man. He graduated from Sandhurst. But whilst C.S. Lewis was born in Belfast and whilst the city is proud of him as a son, he's probably more associated with Oxford. He once said that his idea of heaven was getting the city of Oxford and putting it in the county down. Um, and I guess what he meant was Oxford is a beautiful city and the county down, county down is a beautiful county. It's, um, it is, I mean, Northern Ireland in general has some spectacular scenery, um, but it's also rich in prehistoric sites, Bronze Age, um, stone circles and so on. And um, it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly what C.S. Lewis's influence for the Narnia stories were. It is known that in the war years, the were evacuee children stayed with C.S. Lewis in his house in the Killens in Oxford. Um, so no doubt that played a role in the formation of the Pevensey Pe children. Um, his own experience of the First World War would have been an influence on the, the war themes we see in some of the Narnia stories, particularly Prince Caspian. But all seven novels have some sort of themeology going on there that you can make a real world analogy with. Uh, I mean, in the case of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, you could argue that Edmund's betrayal and his going to the White Witch was kind of symbolic of the fall of man and the temptation in the Garden of Eden. Um, Aslam sacrificing himself, of course, the, the Christian sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Um, Prince Caspian, the um, struggle of faith and the... I guess you could say, the, the wars of the early Christians. Um, some have said the voyage of the Dawn Treader, uh, particularly focusing on Reaper Cheap, is, is the, the Christian journey. Uh, the last battle is the, the Day of Revelation. There, there's a lot of, you could look at it uh, any number of ways. Um, Critics, on the other hand, or critics of this theory, say there is no way that C.S. Lewis was really trying to implant these ideas in the minds of young children. But I, I think they're very difficult to overlook. Um, without question, C.S. Lewis was writing for children. These weren't adult novels. Um, they were for children, and they were written in a simplistic way. So critics of Michael Ward's look at the book would say, Come on, Michael, this is this is not what C.S. Lewis was doing. I, I'm sort of somewhere in the middle. Um, I think Michael Ward does make a compelling case that Lewis's Christian apologetics were coming into that. The film Shadowlands with Anthony Hopkins and Deborah Winger, the 1993 version of that, uh, has some very interesting insight into the influence. Um, and there's one scene he was famously friends with J.R.R. Tolkien and another group of academics wrote uh, or met together at a pub in Oxford, which they nicknamed the Bird and Baby. It was, I believe, called the uh, Eagle and, and the Cupid or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But there's a scene where one of his friends is trying to work out the symbolism of Lucy going through the wardrobe and... Um, Lewis is saying, no, it's just simple. It's just magic. And um, that's interesting. In Belfast, actually close to where he was born, there is now a public sculpture of Lewis going through the wardrobe. There's also a mural um, of, of the lion, the witch and the wardrobe, which is particularly in Belfast, which is so famous for its paramilitary murals, quite a refreshing, uh, different piece of artwork to offer. Now, um, the BBC version of Narnia, I want to just discuss this a little bit. Um, you can very much tell it's a BBC production. It's it's quite stagey at parts, but particularly The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe has a certain magic that I, I think was absolutely... It, it's, what, in my opinion, one of the best children's adaptations ever done by the BBC. Um, there is an older version, an American version, that was animated in 1979. Now, with all due respect to fans of that version, I thought it was atrocious. Um, all the children had American accents. It just To me, it just didn't have the magic. But this is very much one of those things, if you grow up with something, you most associate with that. 
I mean, in the American version, Mr. Tumnus looked like a little devil. He just, and the children had American accents when it's very explicit that these are English children going to the countryside because of the evacuation during the Blitz. But the BBC version, I'm um, going to name some of the cast. So the four Pevensey children are played respectively by Peter Dempsey as um, Peter, uh, Sophie Cook as Susan, um, Jonathan, let me get this right, um, get this up on Wikipedia if you bear with me a second. Um, some of the actors went on to do other productions, some of them retired from acting. Excuse me, Richard Dempsey as Peter, Sophie Cook as Susan, Jonathan R. Scott as Edmund, Sophie Wilcox as Lucy, Barbara Kellerman as the White Witch, I thought she was superb, and she reprised her role in The Silver Chair, Harry Shale as Mr. Beaver, Leslie Nichol as Mrs. Beaver, Big Mick as Ginnerbrick, that's the Witch's Dwarf, Martin Stone, Stone as Mogrim, Ilsa Burke, Ronald Pickup, and um, there were three people doing the voice of Aslan and the puppeteers of Aslan. Um, just in case you're wondering, this is that BBC version. That's the more recent DVD version. Um, it, it was just magical. I mean, they, they filmed it in Aviemore in Scotland, at least the snow scenes, and the other productions were good, but The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe in particular was very, it was something special. Uh, Jeffrey S. Perry, who was a Shakespearean actor, played Mr. Tumnus. I have to say, uh, I don't want to, well, you know what, I'll take a risk. I'll move the video and show you something in my street. We are very lucky in this street to have our very own lamppost. This was set up by the local council, and hopefully you'll be able to see. I'll just put the screen outside my window here. Hopefully it will be clear. I don't know how clear that is, but we're very lucky to have our own lamppost, which really does look like the one in um, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And when we just had that snowfall, the beast from the east, I had to watch this. I had to watch the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. It just, it was nostalgic. It was special. And it really was, um, yeah, I love it. I, I love the whole story. I love the idea of it. Um, by the way, this was directed, I should say, by Marlon Fox. It was um, produced by Paul Stone, dramatised by Alan Seymour. So if you do manage to check out the, the YouTube version, do. Now, inevitably, people compare it to the Disney version. Well, uh, as a starting point, this is something very obvious. The Disney version is working on a multi-million uh, dollar budget. A BBC version, perhaps, at the most, a few million. I doubt it was even that. Um, by the way, talking of cast, um, fans of Warwick Davies will be interested to know that he played the role of Reaper Chief in the BBC version. Now, like I said, it's a little stagey, um, and they were working with a low uh, budget. The puppeteers, by today's standards, or the puppetry does look a little bit artificial. Um... My siblings always wind me up that I believed Aslan the Lion was real up until quite late. Um, but basically, I mean, the beavers are much bigger than real beavers. Reaper Cheap is played by the, the war factor um, Warwick Davies, and he's, you know, life size, so much bigger than a real mouse. But that, that staginess, I didn't think it was over the top. I, I thought somehow it added to the magic of it. I, I like that, in fact. And the children, the cast, um, they got a bit of criticism at the time, actually. Uh, Richard Dempsey was seen as being uh, too much of a toff, um, and the other children were criticised. I think I think they done very well, I have to say. Uh, maybe I'm biased because I grew up with it. Now, obviously the big Disney productions had a certain magic about them, but in a way, in a way, I'm happy the BBC version is not well-known. Because it almost makes it more special. It makes it more, um, for those of us who did grow up with it, almost more special. Because the BB, uh, excuse me, the Disney productions are among the 
top 30 grossing films of all time. So it's a, you know, the cast and that was good. Um, the the older BBC version, there were some things that were actually a little bit more loyal to the original C.S. Lewis books. For example, there's a scene where Father Christmas um, says to the girls, you, you cannot fight. Now, I guess for the Disney version, they had to, um, that would have been a bit in, politically incorrect for more contemporary audience. So you could definitely notice differences. But honestly, I think both are good. I, I thought the soundtrack to the film versions was excellent, the Evacuating London in particular. But it, you can't compare them because one is a, is a television production, one is a big studio production. So there's, you know, you can't really compare the two fairly. But for those of us who did grow up with that BBC version, it, it is, in my opinion, something special. Um, I'm going to round this up fairly soon. Um. I know that some authors are very critical of C.S. Lewis. Philip Pullman, in particular, has been very fierce in his criticism. He says that basically Lewis is a charlatan who's trying to... The impression I get is his criticism stems from the fact that he's giving children this false illusion and he's using Christianity in a very cynical way. I, I think he's maybe reading a little too much into it. Yes, there is obvious Christian parallels there, but I suspect most children who read this are not going to go to a church and think, oh, well, Aslan is Jesus Christ. I think it's later on in life that they consider that, and later on in life they can make their own mind up. Lewis's own Christian journey was um, uh, kind of a bit of a roller coaster. He grew up in a Christian family, but he lost his faith at a very young age, about nine, when his mother uh, died. And for many, many years he didn't have faith. And then it was a gradual journey uh, back to faith and his faith was not of the evangelical kind i.e the billy graham school of thought it was um what i would say more down to earth more um traditional church of england uh faith and i don't mean that in a disparaging way just it's it's different it's a different approach now uh final few words i'll say three of the stories the magician's nephew the horse and his boy and the last battle have never been adapted. I find that a little bit unfortunate. Um, in the case of the horse and his boy, and maybe the last battle, I can somewhat understand they would be a little harder to adapt to screen, particularly as the horse and his boy has no connection with Earth, has no connection with England. However, the magician's nephew starts in London, and it's very important in terms of how we understand how the lamp post comes about, how the wardrobe comes about. So I do think it's a pity that's never been adapted either by the BBC or by Walden Media, by Disney. Um, I definitely can see that on the big screen. And fans of the Disney version are long wondering when the silver chair will come out because um, the last one was The Voyage of the Don Treader, which was released in 2010. So it's been eight years now. Um, as I understand it, the contract with the C.S. Lewis estate expired. So that's been put on the hiatus, which is a pity. The Silver Chair, um, starring Doctor Who actor, um, um, ah, my memory's gone today. Um, Tom Baker, Tom Baker. Incidentally, Tom Baker played a fantas fantastic puddle glum, if you're familiar with the story. Um, yeah, I can understand the horse and his boy in the last battle not being adapted, but the magician's nephew, I would like to see that on screen. I really would, because I think it can be adapted. Um, the whole story, the whole background of where Jadis the White Witch came from, uh, how the wardrobe came about, all that story would be something that could be done. Um, I'm sure that I'll think of other things to say about this, because it's a subject that I'm fascinated by. Um, and yeah, let me know your thoughts. If you're a far, fan of Narnia, to what extent to what extent do you think the Christian apologetics come into it? Or do you think that's secondary? I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I think it's you can't totally divorce uh, the analogies. Um, they're clearly there. I mean, Aslan clearly is, particularly in the line in um, in the BBC series, and they downplayed this in the film version, in the Disney version. But in the, um, in the BBC version, they, there's a line where Aslan says, you must learn to know being 
know me by that name in your world. Clearly an analogy to God and Jesus and the resurrection. Um, you know, I suppose hardcore atheists would have a problem with the Narnia series because they would say it's trying to indoctrinate children. I'm not so sure about that because I think, like I say, it's only something that you really notice later in life. Um, in Belfast, apparently, I've just watched a documentary and uh, Lewis's local church had a lion doorknob with the image of a lion on it. That might well be his inspiration for Aslan. But like I say, he was interested in Celtic mythology. So there's probably multiple, uh, and the classics, there's probably multiple sources that he used. But, you know, it's it's lasted the test of time. It really has. And the interesting thing is C.S. Lewis died the very same day as John F. Kennedy was assassinated, the 22nd of November, 63. So guess who got the attention? But that is quite a legacy to have your novel still discussed, still spoken about, still adapted 55 years later. I do wonder what C.S. Lewis would make of the big studio productions. I, I have a feeling he wouldn't be a fan. I don't know. I have a feeling he wouldn't be a huge fan of it. But for me, they, they both offer something in their own way. I like the BBC version and the film version, um, the studio version. So if you can, check out The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader and The Silver Chair. Um, I like them. I mean, you could argue 